everybody. Luke Groman, FFTT. Happy New Year to everyone. Great to see you all again. Uh, hopefully everybody had a great weekend. We had uh, great football this weekend. Unfortunately, the, uh, the old guys at quarterback had a bad weekend between, uh, between Brady and uh, Breeze and then uh, McCown uh, for the Eagles. Uh, they were over for the weekend, so tough one for the old guys. At any rate, uh, wanted to read real quickly just a testimonial about our Tree Rings product. Luke, you cut through the noise and focus on the things that matter in geopolitics and financial markets. Keep up the great work. So uh, if you enjoy these updates, think you'd love Tree Rings. And so with that, we're going to jump right into the, uh, the two things that grabbed my attention recently. So the first was uh, Carl Quintanilla uh, pointed out uh, that uh, the Fed's balance sheet has risen by 101 uh, billion per month, yes, uh, which uh, is nearly, since September, which is nearly dollar for dollar, uh, roughly 80 to 90 percent of the amount U.S. federal debt increases has, uh, has increased in the same time. Uh, we don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, it's something we've been saying that basically what the Fed is doing is effectively financing U.S. deficits through the banking system. This remains a minority view for now. We don't think it's going to remain a minority view uh, for that much longer as we move through 2020. Second thing that grabbed our attention recently was a Barron's article over the weekend. Uh, you know, hat tip to uh, Max for pointing it out or tagging us on it. But the Fed plans to consider permanent ways to keep money markets stable. And to us, um, we've been watching for these signposts where consensus will start to move towards us, which is that these are not temporary. Uh, they are going to be permanent. And again, the Fed is going to have to effectively finance U.S. deficits through the banking system, basically until the dollar weakens significantly for a number of reasons. And so to us, I thought that was a pretty important, uh, a pretty important uh, signpost to keep an eye on something we'll definitely be keeping an eye on going forward. A couple of good questions we received. We're going to jump into those. First off, uh, from Jay, uh, oil prices, just get our thoughts there. To us, we're fascinated to see that once again, oil uh, has not responded in a real major way to what is a very major geopolitical development. Uh, and so uh, you saw it in September with the Saudi uh, explosions. You saw it in the last week with what's happened in Iran. Um, and to us, uh, I think it's further evidence that the uh, multi-currency oil pricing and settlement is, is really a game changer because it, it shifts the marginal barrel of oil pricing uh, to uh, Euro and Yuan in particular. Uh, and that means it becomes a, uh, the, the cross rate between the Euro and Yuan versus the dollar becomes critical to setting dollar oil prices. And, and in plain English, it means you're going to have a hard time having oil run away in a multi-currency oil pricing system unless the dollar weakens significantly. So I thought that was, I thought that was pretty interesting what we've seen so far in terms of oil prices. Uh, from OD, Bernanke saying negative rates should at least be an option to consider to create market ambiguity. Uh, you know, we, we tweeted about this earlier today, um, you know, Bernanke talking about going to negative rates being an option. That, that, to, us, that to us is a political choice. Um, he cites Europe and Japan, uh, where you've seen it tried, and it, you know, he said it hasn't had obvious drawbacks or something like that. That, as everyone is fond of saying, well, the dollar is the reserve currency when you have these types of discussions. Well, that's a double-edged sword, right? The dollar is the reserve currency. There'll be seven trillion dollars in FX reserves uh, denominated in dollars, which is the majority of global FX reserves, that would start bidding for other assets, uh, gold perhaps. Uh, certainly, uh, if you saw the U.S. go to nominative ne nominal negative rates. And so that's really a political choice because it would amount to the U.S. being moving towards ceding uh, the reserve status of the dollar, certainly as it's been structured post-1971. Uh, let's see, next question from AR. Any thoughts on the current repo operations reversing in coming weeks, what that means for Fed liquidity and thus risk assets? You know, I think we could see some reduction in the amounts, certainly. Ultimately, though, they're not going to be able to go too far uh, unless you either get the dollar down or you get the Fed to slash spending in an election year, uh, which is sort of an LOL. That ain't going to happen. Or if you get global central banks to buy more treasuries. Otherwise, the Fed's going to have to keep financing the U.S. government effectively through the banking system. Uh, and that's it. And that's that's the big story people don't really want to talk about there. They want to focus on these technical factors, uh, but they're ignoring the elephant in the room. And so that's something we're going to keep watching for. That said, if they do try it, you know, I think we would see short-term rates begin to rise again like we did uh, in the repo rate spike. And the Fed would then be called back in to uh, put a cap on them as they have um, since 
uh, since September. From RD, what do you think Russia and China are thinking about the recent events of this weekend? Uh, this is something we're watching closely. My guess is they are not particularly happy about it. Uh, but with that said, there's, there's going to be better sources for us to, in terms of all the uh, you know, deep in the weeds relationships between the Russians, uh, the Chinese, and the Iranians. Uh, I would say that uh, as of, I believe, either 2017 or 2018 EIA data, Iran is about 6% of China's oil imports. And that's a big number. Uh, and so my guess is, at the very least, China having 6% of its oil imports disrupted is an absolute red line slash non-starter. Uh, they're already experiencing significant food inflation. They wouldn't want significant energy inflation as well. So that, to me, is, is a, a key pivot that I will be watching to see how that plays out. But in the meantime, I suspect, you know, they've been somewhat quiet this weekend. I suspect that they'll be, you know, continue to be uh, probably reserved and, and let's see how things play out. From PS, a uh, young family has worked diligently to save up a down payment for a home, live in a coastal high cost U.S. city. What's our expectations for real estate in these locations in coming years? Better to keep running and put that money to work some other way. You know, for me, you know, housing's are a, a, a very personal choice, right? It, it depends on what your job is, what industry you're working in, what your, your situation with kids, spouse, etc. So it's tough to offer advice on a one-off thing. I would tell you from experience is that for me, a house is less about uh, an asset that I plan to make money on and more about finding a good place uh, to raise my family. And, and so, you know, I lost money on my last house. I'll probably lose money on this house that we're in now when we move, uh, whenever, you know, our boys get bigger and move away. But I, I don't care. It's, they've been great places to raise families, uh, you know, raise our boys in both cases. And that's, that's the most important thing by far. From a market perspective, since I know that's probably not what people are looking for, you know, I think real estate's going to be a market by market issue, um, depending on demographics. I mean, one thing I did read recently I thought was interesting that you know, boomers have most of the big houses, they've got most of the assets, and they have, you know, they have to sell uh, over the next 10 years. And on the flip side, the, the millennials, their kids, have most of the debt, very few of the assets, and need to buy. And so, in theory, there's a pretty big bid ask spread between particularly uh, McMansions, if you will. Um, and so that would, in theory, you know, weigh, be a factor that could weigh on home prices, particularly in certain markets. That said, the flip side is, is, you know, as we've talked about, it's a matter of national security for asset prices in the United States to rise ad infinitum. And, you know, we, we, we can all but infer or all but uh, uh, realize that the Fed understands this. And so, um, you know, the flip side of this is, is asset price inflation, we think, is supportive of home prices. And the Fed, we think, will do whatever it takes to keep them moving and up and to the right. And so that is something that's probably positive for real estate prices and demand all else equal. So with that, we're going to finish it up for the night. I want to thank everybody for joining us again. And as always, check us out, fftt-llc.com for more information on what we're up to and about tree rings we talked about earlier. Otherwise, everyone have a great week, and we look forward to chatting with you soon. Take care, everybody.